I'm Eliza Van Court, and this is Claim Your Space. Get ready for real talk with brilliant, badass women who will help you live the life of your choosing unapologetically and bravely. Welcome to the conversation. I had three children. I am a parent of four kids, my nephew, my two sons, and my daughter. Um, But I birthed three children. Uh, And when I had my first child, it was a battle. It was a battle to have the birth the way I wanted it to be. Because back in the day, they were not very happy if you wanted to do natural childbirth in certain parts of New York City, because it just wasn't done. Then with my next birth, I had a water birth with my daughter, which was absolutely beautiful. I had it with a nurse midwife. Incredible. And the final one, my my son, Lucian, the doctor turned around after breaking my water, turned back and Lucian was in my hand on the table. I guided him out onto the table with my hand, as I did with my daughter. I guided her into the water with my hand. So for me, having those experiences, experiencing that level of pain really, and and then getting through it and birthing my children is something that I look back on throughout my life. And when things are hard, I think, you know, I pushed a human out of my body. So I think I'm going to be fine. Like I grew a baby, I grew a baby, and then I pushed the baby out. So I think for me, birth has always been very political. It is political because we control if you have to give birth, how you give birth. We're still controlling women in hospitals and, and who are, who've come from prison and strapping them down to tables in some hospitals. There are parts of the country where black women are dying at rates that are just atrocious when they're giving birth. Birth is not just birth. Birth is another frontier where women are fighting for their autonomy and for their bodily control. So I have a wonderful guest today who I'm so excited to talk to, who I know well, very dear friend of mine, and I'm just thrilled to have her on the show. Before we start, we have some sponsors I need to shout out to. First of all, Overplay. Overplay is an amazing new startup where you can get a personal video and run it through an app and turn it into a game. It is amazing. You should check it out. And the other sponsor we have is Madison Savile. Madison Savile makes these unbelievable, cozy, comfy blazers that I absolutely love and covet. And they're very generously sponsoring us. And I'm so excited that they're here for a second season. So, but today we are going to be talking to someone who I met in a really interesting way. Um, She actually had been dating my boyfriend before we met, before I met my boyfriend. And um, I did not know of her, but my boyfriend talked about her all the time. And then one day he said, let's hang out with this woman. And I was a little suspect. I was like, is this going to be awkward? But we ended up hitting it off. And I found out that she's just one of the most amazing, cool people. And then I asked her if she would be on my podcast. And luckily for me, she said yes. Her name is Shannon Chang. She is an award-winning nurse who was named Minnesota Nurse of the Year in 2017 in her field. She ran the labor and delivery unit at Jersey City Medical Center. She has now left management to pilot a new education program at a different hospital teaching nurses how to be labor and delivery nurses, from reading fetal monitors to coaching birthing mothers to advocating for patients. Her hospital, which she totally loves, has said she can actually say whatever she wants, which is really unusual, very cool hospital, um, as long as it's really clear that she's not representing her hospital. So in order to err on the side of caution, Shannon and I decided that we want a whole no holds barred conversation, so we're not gonna be mentioning the name of her hospital at all, not because she has a problem with them. She actually loves them and has nothing but positive things about to say about them, but she just wants to make it really clear that she is not representing her hospital. Her views are her own. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to the extraordinary and wonderful and amazing Shannon Chang. Shannon, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to have you. You are welcome, Miss Eliza. I am glad that we could find our time finally to make it all work out. I am so, so excited to have you here. So why are you a nurse? Like what what made you decide to be a nurse? You know, it's really interesting to me because I think nursing is one of those fields that is really undervalued. Although I think the pandemic started to change that. People were like, oh, we kind of need nurses. (laughs) They're kind of critical for being alive. 
But I think for a long time, nursing, because it's a woman dominated field and women dominated fields tend to be undervalued, we're just not valued. So, you know, you could do anything. You're brilliant. What made you decide to become a nurse? For a long time, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I bopped around in theater. Um, I just tried a finance career because I sort of fell into it and was enjoying some success. Um, but felt this yearning that I'm not doing something important enough. And then I started finding something that I liked in finance, which was to help the little guy. I was helping little old ladies with little $50,000 portfolios and spending a lot of time with them. And in finance, you're measured by the the, the success measurement is how quick your call time was, mm. how much of the time you spent with somebody. And because little old ladies tend to have lots of questions, <laughs> um, God bless them. I got dinged real hard in one performance review where they said, you just, you're, you got to work on having shorter times. You need to be quicker. Mm. And I remember after that, leaving that performance review thinking, but I have finally found what I like in finance. And if I'm being criticized for what I'm doing well with and what I'm connecting to, then forget it. My then husband um, said, well, you should do whatever you want. Close your eyes and picture what you want to do. And um, I played around in my mind of, do I want to be a midwife? Do I want to be a doctor? And I wanted the immediacy of nursing. It is said that doctors treat a condition and nurses treat the patient. Mm -hmm. um, and more of a whole person approach. It's practicality. It's a wonderful profession for women, especially women. I, I knew I wanted to be a mom. There's flexibility. Much of my life is drawn is is informed by my um, feminism. So I was drawn to how obstetrics centers around women. Mm -hmm. That was the draw. I think it's fascinating. I get to be there when people meet their children, which I'm just. I, I, I there's there's nothing more beautiful. I feel so lucky. I I, I watch before my eyes. I watch women turn into mothers. And men turn into fathers. Oh my God, you made me cry. <laughs> That's really beautiful. I am telling you without exaggeration, it still moves me. To me, like I, I will say, when I had my baby, when I had Jonah, the first child that I had, I remember people talking about bonding and all those things. And I thought it was just magical. I mean, Jonah was kind of an interesting little baby. He came out of me. I put him on my stomach and I'd read that babies will inch up your body to your breast. And I was like, oh, that's just malarkey. That doesn't happen. So I put him on my stomach and he inched up like a little inchworm opening his mouth and, show, and he like literally inched up. I mean, he did become a, like a, I'm not going to brag, but I'm going to brag like a three-time national collegiate cycling champion. So he was a pretty athletic kid from the start, but he inched his way up to my boob and just latched onto my boob. And I was like, what? How is this possible? Whereas my daughter, Ella was like, nah, <laughs> I'm just chilling. You're going to have to put me right there. But it was, it was very interesting. But I remember Jonah nursing and, starting to cry. I started to cry. And I and I was crying because partly it was like, it's so beautiful, but partly because I thought to myself, oh my God, the world is so hard. Like I can't protect him from everything. And it was the most incredible experience of my life to feel this, like I would fight a lion for this child. Like if a lion came here, I would jump in front of that lion in a second. I wouldn't even thought about it. And I never thought that was possible until I had a baby. That power, the, how many moments in our lives do we get to have as those benchmark moments that are shifting and that are that are paradigm altering? And I get to be there and watch that happen. Um, I get to be part of people's stories. I, I, I know not everybody remembers my name or maybe, you know, many details about me, but I love thinking about the hundreds, gosh, now maybe thousands, if I do the math of um, birth stories I'm in, and it might just be, and then the nurse put him on my chest, and then the nurse said, it's time to push, and that's me. Um, yeah. oh, I love thinking about, the, there's the classic picture, the first picture of the baby that a lot of people want to 
um, take a picture of the baby on the scale. You know, yeah, so yeah, that, yeah. That's that's my hand in so many. <laughs> find that my face isn't there. I don't mind. I just love that I'm in so many people's stories. It makes me feel connected to the earth. What a huge, huge gift. I mean, the interesting thing for me though is I was looking up some research before I uh, we started this podcast. I mean, I knew that birth was a controlling thing, but holy crap, like I could not believe the level of misogyny that has been in birth. I mean, I won't say who it was, but a very wonderful, like older woman that I know when she had um, her child, she's, you know, in her seventies now was strapped down to a table and was just they they like she said they gave her medicine against her will she didn't want to take it she was crying they shoved the forceps inside of her and she was screaming and she had nightmares about it for years and she was literally like she, you know she was like a prisoner strapped to a table which they still do in prison some some states still like handcuff women to the bed while they're giving birth which is so completely barbaric that I feel like it's cruel and unusual punishment and should whoever does it should be put up on charges. Like, it's just insane. We've had the wonderful opportunity to talk about what's so beautiful about birth, but there's a dark side very much. And for something that is so female focused, you know, that this is becoming a, a mother, a woman having a baby. What could be more um, more feminist than that? There are nightmares. Um, there are tragedies. Birth trauma is incredibly real. While we have made great strides from the time when one in four women died in childbirth, yes, absolutely, it's wonderful that there is more technology. Absolutely, science is on our side. However, the pendulum is way too far. Um, and it is part of my professional mission to make sure that uh, both my new nurses now that I'm teaching and any patients that I get to talk directly to understand what informed consent really, really is. And what is informed consent? So informed consent, when you sign the consent forms, when you go to the doctor's office or when you have um, uh, anything from getting a vaccination at the doc's office to getting major surgery, um, in the United States, you're required to receive informed consent. Mm -hmm. There is um, unfortunately a variety of opinions on how informed that informed consent needs to be. Birth to me is actually a very political issue. I mean, when I was, you know, when I was giving birth, it was a fight at NYU. I had a friend who was in law school and she sat my friend, Maura Kennedy Smith, she's a judge now. She sat in the waiting room as a backup in case they wouldn't give me Lucian back. And they almost didn't. Like they would not let us have him. They took him away from me the minute he was born. They, you know, I was like, why is it taking so long? And they're like, well, we don't, you don't need him. And I was like, yes, I want him here. And it was just this huge fight. And finally, I was like, I have a, a lawyer here. And if you don't give me my baby, I'm going to have to start taking legal action. <laughs> and they finally gave me the baby back. But it was like whereas with with um, with Ella, John Paul, my ex-husband just opened up his shirt put her on his chest. We put the warming lamp on. Everything was great. So, you know, it really, the difference just in the time, like seven years apart of my oldest son and my youngest child couldn't be more different, but there are still parts of the country that, you know, women are, you know, it's so interesting because every part of women's reproductive life is always, I think, under siege, right? Like, can you choose to have a baby? If you choose to have a baby, how do you want to have your baby? What rights do you have once the baby is born? Can you give birth the way you want to give birth? And it's changed so much. I mean, can you give us like a little history of what what birth used to be compared to now? Like, how was it back in the day? Not not like the whole history, because people will be like, but, but like, you know, the the very serious, like, you know, Cliff Notes version. The trend went from, the default to births being at home to births should be at a hospital because hospitals are cleaner. The opportunistic view of, okay, now we have women in hospitals. Uh, now we can charge. Now we can make some money off of birth. 
I believe is a crossroads and a very unfortunate one. I have heard it said, this is not my original comment, but I have heard it said that when men got involved with birth, it all went to hell. Yeah. I mean, that's what I read about, you know, because when women were involved, they were, I mean, you were listening to your body more. And when men got involved, they started to try to control the process that the women were doing. Surprising. (laughs) Historically, that's never happened. So it's super, it's interesting to me as a woman, I'm so drawn to labor and delivery because of the beauty of it, but because it comes from women, we, we are the ones that give birth and it's our story. Yeah. Uh, But the tragedy of choices being taken away from women. So things that happened in the hospital, the reason it got so, so what happened? What was the, what were the choices that were taken? You've said a big one, you know, in what, in what position can you give birth? It is so much more natural for a woman to, to give birth at least semi upright, hands and knees, squatting, um, perhaps holding her partner around the shoulders. Cause gravity. It's gravity. It's, it is what our bodies were honestly meant to do. Um, but the choice of, of lying on one's back with the legs in the stirrups is completely physician convenience. Right. You know, 100 percent physician convenience. Our bodies will tell us what to do. They absolutely will tell us what to do when we are told you have to lie this way or you must stay in bed or you cannot drink or eat anything. Then that quiets that power. Mm. I firmly believe much of the trouble starts from there. If you tell a patient who is listening to her body, um, stop listening to your body, you're taking so much of her power away from her. And then it's, okay, well, now I need an intervention because I'm afraid. Now I don't believe in myself. So please, you help me. Interventions are wonderful and have saved so many lives. And it's it's very, very important that we have the medicalization of birth because sometimes we really need it. However, we usually don't. (laughs) And if we remove the patients from the equation of what's happening for you, what do you think? We lose so much momentum and we lose so much. She's got so much power. If we quiet her voice, we're losing all of that. Um, And then everything does fall to the medicalization Let's let's give you something to make the contractions come faster. Okay, that's causing you pain. Let's give you anesthesia. And God bless anesthesia, believe me. Um, however, anesthesia comes with more interventions. And now you need a urinary catheter because you can't go to the bathroom on your own. And now you need something to help with the pain. And so on and on. To me, it all stems from if you're taking away the fuel of the woman knowing what she needs that's when you invite in all these other problems. So interesting, because as you were talking about that, I thought, you know, the process of a woman giving birth and the way in which it is controlled and what happens when she is controlled is parallel to a woman's experience in the world. Like if you take away her voice, if you take away her belief in herself, if you take away her agency, I call that having your compass ripped out. And suddenly you go from believing your own truth to having to look to other people for your truth. And as soon as you're doing that, you're vulnerable because no one knows what you need more than you do. Exactly. I feel as though it's almost like telling a woman, well, we're going to make, we're going to tie your foot to the the brake of this car, but you need to still make it go somehow. Right. Birth is painful. There's no question. It's it's uh, without going back to the history of mankind. So, we, so the fact that we walk upright, we have the lovely advantage of being able to walk upright. Our hips changed. Right. And because we have the lovely advantage of being able to walk upright and our, our hips paid the price, birth is harder. And then we have these big heads to hold our big brains, make birth challenging. Um, evolutionarily, it's fine because we usually have one to how many are the Duggars up to 19, one to 19 babies in our lifetime. So it's a trade-off and it's fine. So there's no question. And if somebody, you know, says to me, 
well, I, I want my birth not to hurt at all. I, I want to have a conversation with them where I want to bring it down to reality. You know, we can, we can talk about how you're going to manage the pain, but make no mistake. It's going to hurt. Oh yeah. Well, that's another thing I think that we see a lot, at least in progressive towns is a real, at least there was for a long time in Ithaca, um, a real judginess for people who took drugs, a real judginess about people who had C-sections. And I, you know, my answer to people was like, you had an actual living creature, like growing in your body and it came out of you and you're alive. Like that's some alien level stuff there. You know, you're a superhero. It doesn't matter how that baby got out of you. And anyone who gives you a hard time is ludicrous. You just, every birth is different. And every buddy, I'm convinced that part of why I had an easier birth is that I'm hypermobile. So my connective tissue is just a little bit stretchier and able to kind of move with the baby. So, you know, you just, I, I think that it's like, I think women are really taught to judge each other. And we're taught to sort of compare. And I think that birth is one of those things that we have to just be cheerleaders for each other, period, amen. Right. We absolutely have to be cheerleaders. And the the birth as competition benefits nobody. It, it absolutely benefits nobody because you have three very different birth stories within your own body. Circumstances are different. What's happening in your life might be different what's happening in your body if you're fighting some some difficult um disease or difficulty in your in your body at one particular time like with my son i had this or my daughter i had this it, it's so different and so for women to hit birth stories against each other i, I find to be ridiculous i have twins and um one of them was what we call transverse so her head on one side feet on the other it was presented to me that I could push him out and then see what my daughter did. And if she turned great, we would have a, a, a vaginal birth. Mm -hmm. If she didn't turn, we would proceed with a C-section. I asked for some time to myself and I thought about what my body needed. And from some sort of wisdom that I still don't understand inside of me, I knew that I was supposed to have the C-section. Mm -hmm. that these babies were supposed to be delivered surgically. I wasn't interested in having both kinds of birth. I didn't mm -hmm. want to deliver vaginally and then deliver by C-section and recover from both kinds. So I listened to that wisdom in my body. Fast forward to um, my twins being about three months old and uh, we discovered a birth defect in my son's neck, um, which if it had to do with the muscles being restricted, if he would have been pushed through vaginally, um, there was a great risk of him getting permanent nerve damage in his neck. So something in me, I, and I don't fully understand it. And I'm this you know, scientist who says, oh, that's ridiculous. Did you have some sort of intuition? I don't know. I do know that I was allowed to listen to my body and allowed to listen to whatever wisdom was, was inside of me. And I said, I choose a C-section, please. And it was the best mm -hmm. thing for all of us. And you know what that makes me think about, first of all, that's an incredible and beautiful story. I did not know that about your story. That's just incredible. It's like, it makes me want to cry. <laughs> ah, birth is so verklempt. But, um, but the other thing that, that it makes me sad because I know the level of Black women who are dying in childbirth at this, in this country, in some parts of this country at, at rates that are the same as developing countries, you know? And it's just unbelievable to me, you know, the global, the people in the global South and people in Mississippi are, are, are having this same problems um, because in this country we have such racism. I mean, what do, have you thought, have you experienced that or how do you work? What's your take on that? So it is our biggest crisis in obstetrics, the maternal mortality rate of, um, of Black women. Um, and it is, as you say, the worst in uh, in all developed nations. And in fact, there's some develop, un, undeveloped nations who are doing better than we are. Um, and maternal mortality in general 
across the board is not amazing in the United States. We're not anywhere where we need to be, but the rates at which black patients are dying is, is nothing less than a 911 crisis. Um, and have I seen it firsthand? Uh, the problems I have, I have, you know, knock on wood, not had a maternal death in the rates that we're seeing. A black woman might come into the triage unit and say, I'm having pain. And I have seen physicians write off their complaints as frivolous or something they don't need to take seriously. And I get up, I get very emotional about it myself um, because I feel so helpless at times. Like, what do we do? What are we going to do? Dear God, what are we going to do? Not in the moment, because I'm assuming you are quite the advocate in the moment, but more on a meta level. On the meta level, exactly. What are we going to do? I had the distinct honor of going to um, our national conference of, of the organization of, of um, obstetric nurses in New Orleans a couple months ago. And it was about 95% of what we talked about is what are we going to do? Um, and wonderfully empowering. What are we going to do about the mortality of Black women dying in childbirth? Yeah. It's not a bunch of white folks that are going to fix this. It's going to, uh, that's going to solve all the problems. Yes, white folks need to do their part, but we need to recruit more black women to become obstetricians and midwives, um, neonatologists, pediatricians. There's uh, a lot of um, movement toward this idea of cohort care, where the model of, you know, you go to your prenatal appointments you have your appointment and you're there for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and then you go home. Um, a different model of maybe six or seven women go together to their appointments. Oh, and wow. these six or seven women spend three or four hours at the, the doctor or midwife's office. And then they're a cohort and they move through the system together. You know, it's so interesting because, you know, using like privilege that I mean, you want to use your privilege, right? To to help people. Like if you're going to have privilege, you should use it to make sure that other people get it as well. Um, and this is the kind of thing that's so infuriating on one side. And some people would say, well, we shouldn't do that because we don't need to. But I would argue that, you know, <laughs> in a perfect world, we should never have to do that. It's disgusting. It's racism. It's awful. But you know, we are at a point where we're just trying to save lives and we don't have time to worry about anything but saving the lives right now. And I think that kind of thing is really critical. Um, it's interesting. I was working at a university and I was, this was years ago, they had a, all these tables in the hallway, um, in the grand hall. And one of the tables, the this woman who I was working with said, oh, you know, we have this table called Ask a Black Person. And I, I and and I said, oh, like what? And she said, no, 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 it's good, it's good. The the black students came up with it because they had all of these white people who didn't know what to do, didn't know how to ask questions, felt like there was this big divide, and so we started to, um, we, we they started this thing, and they have a chair, and white people can go ask stupid questions, and it actually formed a lot of really good friendships, and. Later, I talked to her a year or two later, and she said it also resulted in some of the Black students actually getting that intergenerational privilege, the benefits of it, because they became friends with some of the so the white students who then helped them get jobs because their daddies and their mommies, you know, were highly connected. So, you know, obviously privilege is so deeply unfair, but if you're going to have it, I think the only ethical thing you can do is to, to use it, you know, to help other people. Not, and that's not the white savior thing. That's a whole nother thing, but I think we have to be super careful not to be so afraid to be a white savior that you decide, you know, you choose your own comfort and fear of looking bad over doing it. And instead you do nothing to me. That's, that's a, uh, you you have to take the risk that you're going to do it wrong, but at least try. I was at a lecture and it was it was given by this wonderful black woman who the, the topic of the, of the discussion was uh, fighting racism in obstetrics. And she said it was a largely white crowd, probably about 80 percent white. And she said, all right, folks, I'm going to I'm going to present a patient situation and I want you in your mind to think about what was going on and then and then we'll talk about it. 
okay, you have you have a black woman as a patient. You are caring for this black woman. She's your patient. And she is laboring on her own without any medication. And she starts hitting her head. She starts going like this. What is happening? What's going on? And what should you do? So we're all sitting there in the crowd, a few of us looking at each other like, I have no idea. And Is what the I answer thought, just, do you ask her why she's hitting her head? Oh, Eliza, what a simple, simple answer. And yes, of course. Oh, okay. I was like, I don't get it. Is it a trick question? <laughs> the white person in me um, thought to myself, well, that is a that is some sort of coping mechanism and she's lost a little bit of her senses and why is she hitting her head? And she's the poor deer. She needs some, maybe she needs a, a psych consult. Right. We get to the end and, and, and people are sort of sharing their answers. And I sort of, I thought to myself, well, I don't want to look stupid and say it if it's wrong, but I decided, listen, I'm here to learn. So I said, here's what I think is going on. And the instructor's like, okay, all right. All right. The answer is, and, and most of the black women in the room said, her braids itch, her weave itches. Oh, interesting. Her weave itches. And she's, she's you know, because labor's intense. Right. And oh, so humbling. Yeah. I mean, I think that's that's like for me with, with anything that has to do with race, I'm usually just like, well, I'm going to assume I don't know anything. <laughs> so I'm just going to ask the question. <laughs> I've seen too the arc over a period of time of of like oh this problem is happening but we can't talk about it no we're going to talk about it and we're going to say the words black patients we're going to say black women are dying we're going to call it out um, I worked with a wonderful obstetrician who when this news was really really taking um, headlines and really coming to the forefront the next several times she and I took care of a black woman she, a black woman she would say listen, I'm going to call out this thing that's in the news and, you know, the statistics are bad and here's what I do about it. And you can always speak up if you feel scared, um, if you're worried at all. And that was such a lesson to me of, okay, be a little uncomfortable, get over it. Yeah. I think that so much of race in general and, and just in life really is, you know, the fear of asking because you don't want to look dumb causes us to protect ourselves at the expense of other people. And it's so much more important to look dumb <laughs> because we are dumb about experiences that aren't our own. I would have never guessed it was braids. I probably would have been like, hey, I noticed you're hitting your head. I'm wondering, is everything OK? Because I'm not sure what's going on here. It's <laughs> great. And from now on, I will. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that birth particularly is so charged, you know, that you add all any other layer onto it. And boy, that's like incredibly charged. Every birth, and this is part of why I love it, it it's a little mini story. You, A woman becomes a mother and she runs into her own childhood over and over and over again. You know, um, Every moment that you have with this, with this little one, one can't help conscious or unconsciously you think about your own self at that age. And then there's all the things in society about, you know, we, we have to be amazing in our jobs and in our relationship and we got to be amazing mothers. So much pressure. Oh, um, I know. And, and, and when men do the littlest thing, everyone's like, Oh my God, he's such a great dad. Did you see, he took his kid to the park and then they're like, you know, that mother, like she just like, I see once in a while, her husband is taking her kid to the park. You know, it's like, wait, what is happening? But yeah. luckily, a lot of men are stepping up, like our 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 mutual friend Dan, um, my ex, my boyfriend, your ex boyfriend, like your friend, dear dear friend. Um, you know, he he's the he takes care of his kid all the time. You know, and he gets really annoyed that the school always thinks it's the mom that they should call when really both parents are involved. And so I think it's it's really important so important to understand. And I had a single, I mean, my dad took care of me on his own for quite a while until my stepmother came on the scene. And, but I will say on the other hand that, you know, he got a lot of people praising him for that. He said, and he's, he's, he'll be the first person to, to say that, you know, 
he'll say, he's, he said that people would say to him like, oh, it's so great. You're doing it's so great. And it's definitely not the, what they say to single mothers. <laughs> I mean, right now, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because we're in this moment in society with our new Supreme Court where we're dealing with the fact that they are trying to control women's bodies. And I think control of women's bodies, it, you know, it's a, con- to me, it's a continuum. Like, you know, what should you wear so that you are not assaulted rather than maybe we should not assault people? You know, what, what are you going to like when you, when you get pregnant, you know, you lose the control of what happens, right? Like in many states now, you're not allowed to have an abortion. So you are forced to be a mother, which to me is bananas because I wanted to be a mother and it is so hard. And if someone told me to be a mom and I didn't want to be, I can't even begin to imagine what that would be like. On top of which now we're having these draconian laws where women are wanting to have babies and they have to wait till their baby dies before they can have an abortion. I mean, it's just so absurd all the way through to the history of women being controlled as soon as men entered into the medical scene with birth, you know? And I think a lot of young people now don't understand that my generation had to fight to have natural childbirth in many parts of the country and that women are still being totally controlled. For example, women in the prison system, So birth is to me a very political issue, whether you give birth, how you give birth, you know, how you're treated after you give birth, how you're treated when you're there, depending on your race. These are all things that I think um, we need women in those positions of power advocating, because if we don't have that, we are going to lose people. We're going to lose women. It's a, it is literally a life and death matter. Um, and to your point about it being an emergency, it absolutely is. Um, when women are told somebody knows better about their own body, no matter what it is, whether it, what you wear, what you put in your body, what you do with it medically, when, when the message is, no, the locus of control should be outside of you, you, the woman that is living in the body, we lose our power and, at the very least, our power is 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 made smaller, and we don't have time for that. And <laughs> we have so much power in us; we have so much to give. So anybody who would quiet us, I think they better look out. They better get out of the way. I feel so so drawn to teaching both patients and then the next generation of nurses to fiercely protect informed consent, to absolutely step in to say excuse me, uh, she did not consent to this. You need to stop what you're doing. I, I know it's an awkward conversation. I've, I've been in rooms where the doctor might say, well, we're just going to break your water now. And to stand even maybe with your voice shaking and saying, do, do you have any questions about that? Would you like to, to ask your doctor before you consent? Say those words. We say the words consent. Um, and it can be a fight. It can be a real fight. An obstetrician might say, how dare you threaten my, I've known her for nine months. I've been doing her prenatal care. I know what she wants. I need to hear the words consent. I need to hear a patient say, yes, I consent to that. And I'm going to teach it. And I will teach that because I believe in it so strongly. I never thought about birth as consent. I thought about like sex as consent. That's so interesting that consent runs the continuum from sex to what can happen because of sex. You know, I never thought about that. Yeah, right. Really, really interesting. Can you, are you allowed to share like one story where you were just like, nope, this is not okay. Like, is that you have one like awful story? You know, you know, you told your beautiful story, but do you have any stories you can share that are like, that was not okay? I was new at a hospital and I've worked at many, many hospitals over my career. I was new at a hospital. I was on orientation myself and, um, a patient was pushing and I knew that a male physician, male obstetrician had somewhere to be and didn't want to wait much longer. And I can close my eyes and see him lifting the scissors from the table and cutting an episiotomy and not telling, not, not forget asking for his consent. Didn't even tell her baby's out. Everything's fine. Lovely, lovely. 
Um, she gets repaired, stitches, everything. Baby is put on her chest, all is well. Doctor takes off his glove and leaves the room. The patient's partner says to me, what, what, ha what happened? And the onus became on to me to explain, well, the physician cut an episiotomy so that we could make a bigger opening so that your baby could be delivered faster. And then the dad said to me, why was there something wrong? And because I won't lie to patients, I had to say, no, everything was, everything was fine. Um, and I, I, I didn't have the vocabulary to give him a good reason for why that episiotomy was cut. He didn't push it. And then he was charmed by his baby and we moved on, but I'll never forget that feeling. I hated it. Um, there wasn't a good reason to cut that episiotomy. I couldn't explain it away. And plus that physician should have been in the room answering that question himself. Um, the patients didn't feel the patient and her partner didn't feel comfortable asking about it until after he left. Do you remember like the first time you stood up and said, no, I'm not, this is not okay. I had a patient who we were concerned about the baby. The fetal heart rate was, was concerning. We were in a position where we need to focus and get this baby out pretty quick. However, things were moving along and I had an instinct that a vaginal delivery was very, very much possible and would be better. Um, now, granted, I'm a nurse, not a physician. However, I have been around <laughs> and at the time did know my stuff. Um, the physician came into the room because he was called into the room because the, we were concerned about the baby. And the, the doctor said, we should go back for a C-section. And I believed very strongly that he was wrong and that if he let this patient push, we could have a baby. So I said something. I said, Doc, I, I think if we let her push, we could, we, could, we could go pretty quick. And he said, no, get her ready for the operating room. And I'm very proud of the fact that I said, let's just try. And three minutes later, the baby was out of her body. Afterwards, the patient said to me, Shannon, thank you so much. And she said, don't think I didn't notice the dirty look he gave you, but thank you for not caring. It, I just, I, that's one of my favorite births too. Ah, that's amazing. It's so hard to, to stand up to someone who has so much more power and privilege than you do. It, it, it's not easy. And I don't think we talk about our age and nurse years. You know, I, I think I was the two year old nurse. Shannon would never have been able to do that. But um, I was already in my 20s by then in nurse years. Um, and I, I was able to do it. Um, and I was also happy that I was modeling that for another nurse who was in the room. It's terrifying. It, it, the doctors still, still the patriarchy is real and the the hierarchy of, of, of the doctor, though many obstetricians these days are women, but there's still this hierarchy of the doctor having more power than the nurse. Um, but it's changing. And if we're vocal about about the the equal roles, that it really should be collaborative between a doctor, a nurse, and the patient. Think about that much more power that all three have together. So what can a woman do if she feels like something happened in the birth that she wasn't happy with? Is there something she can, can she talk to the hospital and just tell them if, to make sure it doesn't happen to someone else? Um, absolutely. All hospitals um, will have some sort of patient rep. Um, and the patient patient representative um, very much cares about those things. Um, and so if a patient has, if a woman has a, an experience where she had some questions, I always recommend that she do talk with her doctor first. But if she doesn't feel comfortable or doesn't get the satisfying conversation when she initiates that, go to the patient rep. And what, what can you do if you're in a situation where you're, I mean, it's so vulnerable when you're giving birth, what can you do if you, if they're saying, you know, you need a, you need a C-section and you're like, I feel like the baby's coming. What, what can you do? The patient can always say, and I think these words are very valuable and um, are going to resonate. I do not give my consent. Just simple as I do not give my consent. Can you please tell me the, the benefits and the risks? And do we have any alternatives if we don't do that right now? But I think that a real important thing as a woman's preparing to give birth is to have these conversations well before 
um, well before the delivery room. Being prepared, really getting to know your provider, your your doctor or your midwife, what kind of birth philosophies they have. Have those conversations in week 20, in week 24 at your prenatal visits. Make time for them. Why do you think it's so important for women to have a positive birth experience? Like what? Who cares? It's only a couple of hours of your life. For one thing, it's it's one of those transforming moments in our lives that we take on a new role. There's also really good evidence that supports that relationship with your child is is um, more positive if you can feel positive about your birth. Not necessarily that it's a great birth, but that you can feel powerful about it. You know, you understand the distinction, like maybe it was painful, maybe it didn't go the way you wanted, but that you as the patient can understand, this is why this happened. This is why this choice was made. Um, It belongs to me. And that paves the way for your motherhood belonging to you. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm been an amazing conversation by the way thank you so much for coming and talking to me every time we have conversations when we are hanging out i always i'm like oh we got to get this on the podcast (laughs) this is so important so i'm so glad you took the time to talk about it it's something that i think we don't we talk a lot about the politicization how how political it is if, if you can give birth or not like can you terminate a pregnancy but i think the act of giving birth on your own terms is an incredibly political act it is an act of empowerment to say, this is how I want to bring my child into the world. And you're going to hear me and believe me and listen to me. And this is how it's going to go. And at the same time, you're so vulnerable because pushing a baby out of your body is hard. So to have someone there to help you advocate, to have that experience, what you do is so incredibly important. So first of all, thank you. And second of all, can you leave us with three things that you think women can do right now to make their lives or other women's lives better? Because I always like to do some concrete advice at the end of this podcast. Uh, absolutely. Um, so it's starting to allude to this, that it, when when you're choosing with whom you're going to give birth, um, whether it be at a birth center with a doctor, with a midwife, at the hospital setting, um, don't save those questions for the delivery room. I recommend that women write down what their priorities are in terms of, you know, breastfeeding is very important to me, or I very much want to do this birth without medication, or I very much want as many medications as possible. And please tell me your, your philosophy doctor on which ones you think are safe. Have those conversations early. And here's a very concrete thing. Please write those questions down. Um, it's so easy to forget and it's so easy to be dazzled by, Ooh, we're going to do an ultrasound and Ooh, we're going to see the baby. So write your questions down, ladies, and think about what it is that you want to know and have the conversations early um, so that you can feel empowered that it will be a conversation and not a the doctor is going to have all the power. Questions like who delivers if you're busy, doctor, and um, do you have a practice that you share with other docs? Or is it just you? Um, What if you have to be at another birth? What's going to happen to me? Know those things early. So you're not surprised. The second thing that they can really do is when they're thinking about birth, that they want to prioritize what's important to them. Um, Births can go lots and lots of ways. And if there's, you know, there's 99 things that can happen. If you pick your your three most important things. I think that's a worthy thought exercise. Like it's, I I would like it if I uh, never had to take any medications, but what's most important to me is breastfeeding. Or I would like very much for my partner to never be away from me, but if they have to be, uh, here's the circumstances in which I want them there. So do you understand, you know, like make your priorities and pick your three most important uh, priorities for how you want your birth to go. Lastly, really give some thought to pain and prepare yourself. Um, If it is a goal to have an unmedicated birth, then get yourself um, the tools in your toolbox that you need, whether that's um, hypnosis can be wonderful, reading up on pain. And I really advocate a doula. Doulas are a wonderful thing um, and they're evidence-based to have uh, outcomes in the birthing room um, improve. Thank you so much. Um, This is really helpful. There are so many women. I don't think we talk about birth enough. 
and all the different facets of birth. And so um, you're somebody who, when you talk about it, you talk about it on the very micro level and talking about it on a real macro level, which I think, you know, women's bodies have been, we've been fighting for control of our bodies for a long time. And, and um, this is just one way we're continuing to do that fight. So thank you so much for being here, my friend. I really, really enjoyed having you. I'm glad I finally was able to coax you on my podcast. <laughs> Joy. It was a treat. Thanks for listening. And I hope our conversation inspired you to claim your space. If you have topics you'd like me to talk about, women you'd like to hear from, or want to learn a few more things from my newsletter, join my community of space claimers at elizavancourt.com. And don't forget to follow me on social media. See you next time. We got this.